Have you been to the adventure park in Rotorua called the Agrodome or Velocity Valley? It's a, it's a theme park, there's um, bungee jumps, there's, there's farm tours, there's lots of different activities that you can do there. And there's this one ride in particular that you can do and it's called Freefall Extreme. And it is an outdoor skydive simulation machine. In fact, it is a DC-3 V16 1000 horsepower jet propelled outdoor skydive simulation machine. And the reason that I know that is because my dad built that in 2001. And see, at the time that it was built, it was actually New Zealand's first, actually even the Southern Hemisphere's first ever outdoor skydive simulation machine or vertical wind tunnel, because most of them are built for the indoors. But my dad, he's got this factory in Upper Hutt, and over one summer, he was able to piece it together bit by bit. And he spent hundreds of hours putting this thing together and, and creating it literally from the ground up. And the day came when he'd finished building it and we put it on the back of a truck, we, put it up to, we, we took it up to Rotorua, we got the thing all set up and we got it all connected in. And we got this man who was, um, he had a specially adapted flying suit and so that he could fly on the wind tunnel. And what we did is we put him down on this fly zone and we lay him down flat and it was like, it was like the moment of truth. And we said, okay, everybody ready, turn the thing on. And we turned the thing on. And nothing happened, except a whole lot of smoke and a whole lot of noise. So we thought, well, this is a little bit awkward. Maybe we just need a bit more power. So we said, more power, turn it up louder. And so we turned it up louder. And, and, I think, and all of us watching saw him go probably about that far off the ground, which all of us who were watching, we wouldn't exactly say that was mimicking skydiving. Well, unfortunately, things actually went, went from bad to worse because we actually, we started having problems with the neighbours, they were complaining about the sound, the noise levels. I mean, who doesn't love a DC-3 propeller in, the back, in their background all day, every day? The council, they became really difficult to work with. And essentially, this thing that my dad had built needed an entirely new restructure. It needed to be built again from the ground up because it needed to be quiet and down, but it also needed to retain its power in order to fly somebody. And so it was back to the drawing board. My dad spent hundreds more hours thinking through this whole thing. How's he going to fix this problem that he's got? He went back to his factory in Upper Hutt and he built it again. And it was a really, uh, became actually a really stressful time for our family because we had to, we had to re, we remortgaged our house. Anyone who could loan us money did loan us money. It was really stressful. But finally the day came and, we had, and my dad had cracked it and we, we got the guy back again. We got him in a specially adapted flying suit. We got him to lie on the mat and we said, turn it on. And we turned it on and nothing happened. You know, I'll never forget the look on my dad's face as he sees all of his hopes and his dreams of business success, his debt coming to the forefront of his mind, his, his efforts of, of creating something interesting and fun and unique come up to zero. And you know, when I think back to that story, two questions come to my mind. The first is, what is my response when things don't go the way that I had hoped that they would go? and who or what is worth putting my hope in. You see, um, I know that my story is not actually, my story is not unique, my story is not extra special. We can all share stories that we have got of, of life, of stories that we have of life not going the way that we hoped that it would go. We could spend even just the next half an hour sharing stories of the last couple of years of family milestones that we've missed out on, of, of births, of marriages, of funerals that we have we're not been a part of because of the COVID restrictions. But even just COVID aside, we could all share stories of just the general trajectory of our life or, or the narrative of our life not going the way that we had hoped that it would go. See, if hope is, a, is an expectation or a desire for something good in the future, then often the, the shadow side of that, the downside of that, the, the reality of that is unmet expectations. And unmet expectations, it can manifest itself in many different ways. 
it, it can and it can lead it can it can lead to def, to disappointment, it can lead to confusion, it can eventually lead to despair. And what we do when we have these unmet expectations is we don't want to feel that feeling of disappointment. We don't want to feel that feeling of lack. We don't want to feel that feeling of being not enough. And so sometimes we reach for these, these external behaviours. We reach for our, our short temper, or we reach for our full-blown anger, or we reach for our, our comfort behaviours, or we reach for our, our addictions in order to not feel that feeling, in order to, to quiet down that voice in the back of our mind that, I, that that if I had just worked harder, if I had just had a different idea, if I had just prayed enough, then maybe I would not have this sense of feeling like I'm lacking and this sense of disappointment. See, but sometimes disappointment, it can be an emotional signal from our body telling us that our hope is in the wrong thing or in the wrong person. And if you had to really think about it, where would you say your hope actually lies? Many of us listening today, we're Christians and we would say our hope is in Jesus. But what does that actually mean for your real, for your day in, day out life? See, a lot of us, um, many of us, not all of us, but many of us, we, we subconsciously subscribe to this idea, which is called the myth of progress. And this is this very, very quiet idea, that, but sure idea that we have that our life is going to take this trajectory towards improvement, towards getting better, and towards complete fulfillment. And, and some of us even have this really subconscious idea that we're going to what that looks like in real life is that we're going to find some, we're going to find a job that's really high paying, that's creative and has a fun outlet. I feel like I'm helping the world in some way while I'm doing it. And along life's journey, we're going to find our soulmate and they're going to fill our every need and want and desire because they know inherently our every need and want and desire. And we build a family and we have a life together and it all just becomes wonderful towards the end. And while those things aren't inherently wrong in themselves, when that elusive set of circumstances is gone, what have you got left? Maybe is your hope and fulfillment in your ability to earn money? Is your hope and true fulfillment in your ability to, to in, in your identity and who you are in your family? Is your hope and true fulfillment in this idea that one day you're gonna make it, you're gonna be famous? Maybe is your hope and true fulfillment in this, in this pursuit of pleasure and one day you're going to reach the state of absolute comfort. See, but what if we changed our definition of hope to a confident expectation in coming good based on the person and promises of God? See, I asked, I asked at the beginning... What's my response when things don't go the way that I had hoped that they would go? And who or what is worth putting our hope in? See, one of the, the pillars of the Christian faith is in the, is in the hope of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have a listen to this verse from Colossians 1 verse 9. For, 1 verse 9 for in Christ... All the fullness of God lives in bodily form and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. What this verse is saying incredibly is that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That the invisible Father with all the glory and the deity and the majesty and the power belongs in the person, in the body of Jesus Christ, in a visible form, with, with facial hair, with a heartbeat, with calf muscles. And we, can, we know that um, through the Bible, we know that God loves humanity enough that he would send his son as a baby to grow into a man. And when we read the rest of the New, New Testament, we know that because of his death, because of his resurrection, we too, believers in Jesus, have been brought to fullness. And what that means is, is that when God sees us, he, he looks at us and he pours out his love on us in the heavenly realms, in the places that we can't see. He looks at us and he pours out his love and his affection and his over us. He gives us every spiritual blessing in Christ. It means that when God looks at us, he, he gives us a spirit of sonship. He adopts us into his family. He calls us sons. He calls us daughters. 
He sets us free from our sin. He makes us pure. He makes us holy, which means set apart in his sight. And when he, when he forgives us our sin and he looks at us and he lavishes his love on us because his love for the son is incredible and his love for us is incredible as well. It means that when he, he sets us free from those thoughts that we have in the back of our head that we just need to work harder, we need to pray more, we need to be more in order to be enough. Because in Christ, you are enough. In Christ, you have received fullness. You know, there's another verse that really brightens this concept for us. It's found in Colossians 3, verse 3, and it says, for your life is hidden with Christ in God. Sometimes I like to imagine it like this. My life is hidden with Christ in God. And what that means is in the depths of your being, when all of those external things, all the facades that you take as your identity or or the things that you find um, define you, when all of that is taken away, when it's just you and your soul before God, nothing can separate you from his love or his presence. Nothing can separate you from his acceptance of you through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, one of the the core messages of Christian hope that we think about particularly at Christmas time in the person of Jesus is one of his names. It's Emmanuel, which is God with us. We read it earlier in the verse, Emmanuel, God with us. God doesn't just leave us to our own devices. He loves humanity enough that he would send Jesus as a vulnerable baby to grow into a man, to be with humanity. And then now, in in our present day, he he leaves us with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with us in our ups and our downs of life and all of the things that are going on in our life. He doesn't just leave us to our own devices just to, to muddle through. But I was saying before that that hope is a a confident expectation of coming good based on the person and the promises of God. See, one of the beauties of Christian hope is that it's not just for today, but it is also for the coming good and the promises and person of God and the coming good. Because Paul says this, that if we have hope and it's only for right now, and if we've received fullness in Christ now, then then why do we even need to have hope for a future? See, but the thing is that the crux of Christian hope is that Jesus is gonna return one day to make all things new. In the language of revelation, he's gonna wipe every tear from our eyes. There's going to be no more crying, no more sadness, no more pain. Paul, he writes to this little town in a church called Ephesus. Sorry, he writes to this little church in a town called Ephesus. He says, With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, not begrudgingly, but according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. To bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. When Jesus comes back, he's gonna bring unity to the places where there is discord right now. Where in your life is there discord right now? When Jesus comes back, he's gonna bring unity to those things under his authority. And um, my children have a storybook and and then one of the lines in it says that when Jesus returns, he's gonna make the sad things come untrue. He's gonna bring justice to the oppressed. He's He's gonna overcome pain. He's gonna overcome suffering. He's gonna overcome death once and for all. That's why at Christmas we contemplate passages like Isaiah 9. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time until forever. Until forever. That's why Christians, we cry out and we say, come Lord Jesus. 
Come and establish your throne with righteousness and justice. Come and, and bring justice back to the oppressed. Come, Lord Jesus, we can't wait till we see your face. We can't wait until you come back and, and restore all things, bring unity to all things under Christ. This is why at Christmas time it's called Advent. We look forward to, to Jesus when Advent means to come. And we look forward to Jesus when he comes the first time as a baby, but we also look forward to him coming again in his fullness and restoring all things. But I do want to make a, a little caveat here and just say that, that hope, it's not, it's, not just, it's not just a pill that Christians take in order to just escape the realities of life. Hope is not just something that we, it's not a platitude. We don't just pat ourselves on the back and say, strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. None of this really matters anyway. But, you know, we don't just sail through life without any pain. I don't even really need to tell you that. And that story that I told you from earlier, we ended up losing our family home. And that whole experience caused, was so stressful and, and upsetting that it caused splinters in our family that some of us have not quite recovered from yet. And yet I distinctly remember at the time of that whole ordeal going on that I could lay my head on the pillow at night and say, whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. God, the God my, my flesh, my heart may fail, but God, you are the strength of my heart. You are my portion forever. You are my inheritance forever. I had this really strong sense that, that, that business success or, or money or um, making a name for ourselves, none of that, that was not the pinnacle of life. That was not the be all and end all of life. Hope, the Christian hope doesn't mean that we just gloss over the realities of life. But it is precisely because we have hope in Jesus that we can grab reality by both hands, stare it in the face and say, where death is your victory. Yes, it stings, but Jesus will have the ultimate victory. So what's your response when things don't turn out as you had hoped that they would turn out? And who or what are you truly putting your hope in? You know, this Christmas time, may you take some time to, to recalibrate and consider where your hope truly lies. If you think about 2022 and, and all of the wins, all of the losses, everything that it threw at you, what was your hope truly in? And what is your hope in for 2023? Have a read of Ephesians 1, Ephesians 2, read Isaiah 9, read Revelation 21 and 22 and let that shape your imagination for the hope that we have right now and the hope that we have in the coming good and Jesus is coming back. The hope that we have in the person and the promises of God. I want to pray just as we finish and Maybe wherever you are, you want to stand up. Maybe you want to um, just hold your hands out in, a, in, like a, in a posture of, of receiving. I want to pray this verse over us from Romans. It says, may the God of peace, I mean, sorry, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, that you may overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.